Welcome to another exciting episode of Out of the Trenches, where I sit here in the Chair of Wisdom and answer all your questions about the First World War. M. Elephant writes, Hi guys! Exclamation point. Greetings from Canada! All right, hi Elephant. Um, Regarding the Battle of the Somme, as I understand that the point was to make a hole in the German lines that troops could pour into causing the breakthrough. I understand this was supposed to involve multiple divisions worth of cavalry. How, or did they, how did they plan to get thousands of horses through the few kilometers of mud of no man's land and the two sides forward trench networks? Thanks for making such a great show. I'm glad you like it. Um, when the Battle of the Somme began, it was the height of summer and the ground was solid. It was only later as the weather worsened that the Somme became a quagmire. The British commander, uh, Sir Douglas Haig, yeah, he envisioned a big breakthrough and the stalemate of the trenches would be swept away. He was fixated on the idea that the cavalry would win the day and mop up the retreating Germans, having been a cavalryman himself in his earlier career. Obviously, as the offensive failed to remove the Germans from their trenches, no mass cavalry charge took place. There, there was actually um, uh, a cavalry charge at the Battle of High Wood during the offensive. Um, the 20th Deccan Horse Brigade, which was a brigade made up of Indian soldiers, were concealed in a cornfield, you know, high corn. Uh, the wood itself had remained largely intact at the beginning of the battle, which left loads of cover for both attacking and defending troops. When the cavalry advanced on the 15th of July, they were supported by a single Royal Flying Corps aircraft that strafed the German positions, then dropped a rough sketch of the German lines to the cavalry. The cavalry enjoyed success initially, as their own machine gun fire was able to help silence some of the enemy machine guns. The Germans, for a while at least, panicked when they heard the British cavalry had broken through entirely and were organizing a counterattack until they discovered the truth that the attack had been halted. The cavalry had been forced to retire. JT Feely 7 writes, Hi Indian crew, I was wondering if you could discuss the stories of a Canadian soldier who was crucified by German troops. Love the show. Okay, the story of the crucified Canadian soldier was used repeatedly in Allied propaganda to highlight the brutality of the Germans. The crucifixion itself, however, was most likely only a story and nothing more. There were three witnesses who claimed to see the body of a Canadian strung up in such a way, but all of their accounts were contradictory. Some say he was crucified on an actual cross, Others reported that it was, in reality, on a barn door. Now that story was reported in the British newspaper, The Times, um, reporting that the soldier in question had bayonets planted into each of his limbs, and once he was immobile, the Germans repeatedly plunged more bayonets into his torso and his throat. Uh, an inquiry was even launched by the House of Commons, by the British House of Commons, to investigate the incident. But the truth was never discovered, most likely, again, because such an incident never took place. Uh, a possible explanation was that the soldier was pinned up in an awkward position by an artillery shell that had killed him, giving him the appearance of being crucified. You know, maybe. Uh, in spite of the lack of evidence, this did not prevent the Allies from using the story for their own propaganda pur purposes, portraying the Germans as monsters. Sharp24 says, Hey Indy, a huge fan of the show. Thank you. Love your work and hope to enjoy the rest of your episodes until, ooh, spoiler, 2018. Well, who's to say when this show's gonna end, you know? Uh, my question is on the other sister ship of the Titanic, the RMS Olympic. What was its role in World War I if it had one at all? Was it a troop transport ship or was it used as a hospital boat similar to the Britannic? The Olympic continued to be used commercially as a passenger liner after the outbreak of the First World War, shipping Americans back to New York since they were, many of them were eager to leave the European continent. The captain of the ship actually was the appropriately named Herbert Haddock, who had the ship painted gray and all the deck lights turned off at night to avoid enemy U-boats. During the ship's final commercial voyage on October 26, 1914, she received a signal from the HMS 
audacious, indicating that its crew needed to be rescued after the cruiser hit a mine off the southern coast of Ireland. The crew were saved, yes, but the sinking of the Audacious was a huge embarrassment for the Royal Navy, and Admiral Sir John Jellicoe ordered that all passengers be kept on the Olympic, right, until they agreed to never ever speak of the event again. Yeah, that didn't go so well. Uh, in May 1915, uh, Olympic was requisitioned by the Admiralty to be used as a troop transport although it was not their first choice for such a role since it was a large and rather obvious target for U-boats. Um, she was stripped of all her peacetime fittings and fitted with 12-pounder cannons and 4.7-inch guns. The new troop transport with a capacity for 6,000 soldiers was put under the command of Captain Bertram Hayes to carry British forces to Mudros, Greece for the Gallipoli campaign. During their journey, they actually came across a group of lifeboats carrying the stranded crew of the French ship Principia, which had been sunk by a German U-boat. The Olympic rescued the survivors, but Hayes came under serious criticism for stopping his ship to bring those men on board. Since the Olympic was such a large target, its speed was you know, its main defense against torpedoes. And stopping entirely meant that if a U-boat was in vicinity, it would be almost impossible for it to miss. And 6,000 men aboard is a heck of a lot of men. The Olympic continued to move troops to the Mediterranean until the end of Gallipoli. And then its purpose changed from transporting British troops to transporting those from Canada across the Atlantic. Um, she also transported American troops to Britain when America joined the war. At this time as well, that ship was given the distinctive dazzle camouflage, which we've talked about many times. On May the 12th, 1918, the Olympic came up against a surfaced U-boat. The Olympic's guns opened fire immediately and Hayes gave the order to ram the submarine. The ship's propeller struck the conning tower of the sub and the German crew abandoned the U-boat. It turned out the U-boat was preparing to fire a torpedo, but was unable to flood its torpedo tubes for launch. Hayes was awarded the DSO for his actions, and after the war, he was knighted for his service as it was estimated that the Olympic had transported over 200,000 troops during the war. If you'd like to see the Out of the Trenches episode where we talk about the Dazzle ships, the Dazzle camouflage, you can click right here for that. Do not forget to subscribe to our channel for all of your dreams to come true. See you next time.